Hi guys, welcome to this summary video on ionic covalent and metallic bonding, which is going to look at all the three different types of bonding and their properties, as well as how you can work out from data and an experiment whether you have an ionic covalent or metallic substance. We're going to start off with a recap then, just all the main things that you need to know about the three different types of bonding. So we're going to start off with lithium reacting with nitrogen. What I want to be able to do is describe and explain the properties and draw the dot and cross diagram for this compound. Remember the first step then, what type of elements do we have? Lithium is a metal, nitrogen is a non-metal, therefore it must be ionic. It's the only one that contains both a metal and a non-metal. So straight away I can say we have a high melting point and hopefully you can remember from the video that's because of the strong electrostatic attraction between the cations and the anions and lots of energy is needed to break the bonds. I can also say it doesn't conduct when solid, that's because of that strong electrostatic attraction, meaning the ions can't move, but it can conduct when molten, when a liquid, because the ions are now free to move. If we move on to the dot and cross diagram, it's a metal and a non-metal, so it's the transfer of electrons, so I need to know what group they're in to see how many they need to lose. Lithium is in group one, nitrogen is in group five, so I draw my outer shells. Lithium wants to lose one electron and nitrogen wants to gain three. So I start off by transferring my electron from lithium to nitrogen. And as you can see on the right hand side, my lithium is now complete. It's got none in the outer shell, but nitrogen has only got six. So I need another two more. So what I do is I add another lithium on the left hand side. I transfer that electron over. I can draw that second lithium in on the right hand side, as you can see here which now gives me seven electrons on my nitrogen's outer shell, but I need one more. So one more lithium drawn, transfer the electron across, then I can redraw my lithium on the right hand side. I've now got my three lithium ions complete and my one nitride ion. So my formula is Li3n. On to a second example. This time I'm gonna have a look at sulfur and fluorine. What are the properties? Can I draw the dot and cross diagram? Well, both of them are non-metals. If they're both non-metals, it must be covalent. So I'm gonna have a shared pair of electrons. So this time I need to figure out the valency. Sulfur's in group six, fluorine's in group seven. Therefore, the valency, if you're in group six, it needs two electrons, therefore it can make two bonds, and group seven can make one bond. So I can work out my stick diagram. Sulfur has two bonds. Fluorine only one, so I can join fluorine onto sulfur twice. And I'm gonna have my stick diagram looking like this. Draw my circles with my overlaps. Put a dot and cross in for every single bond. And then make sure I have eight electrons. Sulfur now has eight. And fluorine's only got two there, so I need to add another six in. And the same on the left hand side. My formula is therefore SF2. Now when it gets onto the properties, we can see I've only got three atoms, one sulfur and two fluorines. Therefore, it's simple covalent. If it's simple covalent, it has a low melting point and it doesn't conduct electricity at all. The reason it has a low melting point, weak intermolecular forces. You just have to remember that. If it has weak intermolecular forces, not much energy is needed to break the bonds. Why doesn't it conduct electricity? There are no spare, no delocalized electrons, no electrons free to move. Therefore, it can't carry or pass on a charge. Example number three, diamond. Nice and simply, diamond is giant covalent. You just have to remember that. The other four giant covalent ones are graphite, graphene, and your fullerenes or nanotubes. So with that comes a high melting point. The reason they've got a high melting point is you've got lots of strong covalent bonds. And therefore, again, lots of energy needed to break those bonds. And diamond doesn't conduct, most giant covalent compounds don't conduct. Reason being, each carbon has four strong covalent bonds. Therefore, there are no spare or delocalized electrons. They can't pass on or carry a charge. Obviously, remember, graphite, graphene, nanotubes only make three covalent bonds, so they do conduct but the majority of giant covalent compounds do not conduct for this reason. Example number four, copper is a metal, only a metal, therefore it is metallic. 
therefore it has a high melting point. It does conduct electricity and it is malleable. Again, just learn those facts, regurgitate them. Why does it have a high melting point? Strong electrostatic attraction. This time it's between the cation and your negative electron and therefore lots of energy needed to break the bond. Hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here. Why does it conduct electricity? It has delocalized electrons. Those electrons are free to move and they can pass on or carry a charge. And then finally, why are they malleable? Again, you've got your strong electrostatic attraction between your cation and your negative electron. Therefore, your metallic bond is not broken when you push the layers past each other. The next part of this video is going to look at how you can work out from data given in a question whether you have something that's ionic, covalent or metallic. So there are a few rules that can help you figure out what type of bonding you've got. The first one I always start off with is does it have a low melting point? If it does, every single time is going to be a simple covalent substance. If not, it's either ionic, giant covalent or metallic. So the next thing, does it have a high melting point and doesn't conduct at all? If it doesn't conduct a solid or liquid, it's got to be giant covalent. Just remember, there are a few exceptions for that, which are your graphite, your graphene, and your nanotubes, and your fullerenes. They will normally give you a clue in the question if it's going to be one of these four, though. Number three, does it conduct when liquid, but not when solid? If that's the case, it's always ionic. Ionic is the only one that will conduct when liquid, but not solid, because the ions are now free to move. And then finally, if it conducts both as a solid and a liquid, is going to be metallic. Just bear in mind those exceptions, graphite, graphene, nanotubes, and fullerenes, because they also conduct when solid and liquid. So let's have a look at an example table. If we start off with substance A, you can see we've got a low melting point and low boiling point. We don't need to look at any of the other properties. Straight away, I can say A is simple covalent. Substance B, it's got a high melting point and high boiling point, so we know it's not simple. We then look at the conductivity. It doesn't conduct as a solid. It doesn't conduct as a liquid. Therefore, it has got to be giant covalent. On to C, high melting point and boiling point again, so that rules out simple covalent. It doesn't conduct when solid. That rules out metallic. It does conduct when liquid. Therefore, the only thing it can be is ionic. And then finally, Substance D, high melting point and boiling point, it conducts when solid and as a liquid, therefore it's going to be metallic. The final part of this video is going to have a look at how you can work out whether something's ionic, simple covalent, giant covalent or metallic from an investigation. So how can we do an experiment to prove this or to find out what type of bonding is going on? I would always suggest your first step is to heat it up, whatever your substance is. If it melts pretty quickly, it's going to be simple covalent. If it doesn't, it's got a high melting point, so it's going to be ionic, metallic, or giant covalent. If it's ionic, metallic, or giant, find out whether it conducts as a solid. So put it into a power pack with a light bulb in. If it conducts and the light bulb lights up, it's either going to be metallic or your exceptions for your giant covalent, which are your graphite, your graphene, your fullerenes, your nanotubes. If it doesn't conduct as a solid, it's going to be either ionic or giant covalent. Now, step three, to find out whether it's metallic or not, can it be hammered into shape? Can you bend it? Can you shape it? If you can, it's metallic. If it's brittle and snaps really easily, it's going to be your graphite or your graphene. And then all we're left with is ionic and giant covalent. So does it conduct electricity as a liquid, but not as a solid? So we've already said it doesn't conduct as a solid. All we need to do now is either melt it or dissolve it. Put it into a circuit with electrodes, like your electrolysis. And if it does conduct, it's going to be ionic. If it doesn't, you're left with your giant covalent. That's all it can be. And that brings this revision summary video to an end. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please click on like down below. You can also subscribe to my channel, you can check out the latest video, and you can visit my website up above here. Bye now.